Yeah, which of the following factors usually has the greatest impact on quail populations in Texas? And I'm sure everybody in here knows the answer to this one. Is it fire ants, weather, endocrine disruptors, hunting, or disease? Disease. Ooh, no, we don't have agreement. We do have two or three different answers. Aha! Okay. The home range of a Bob White in Texas is how big? Is it 5 acres, 25 acres, 80 to 100 acres, 300 to 350, or over 500? Well, you guys are just jumping right up at the end. Jumping. A lot of confidence out here. <laughs> You guys are hoping I'm going to give you the answers right now, right? Doesn't work that way. <laughs> what is the function of a quail's crop or crop if you grew up in the, the poultry industry? What's that thing do? It what grinds up the feed. Ah, uh -huh. well, that's pretty close. But that's not one of the answers that's even listed on here. <laughs> <laughs> Food storage. You like that one? Well, we'll hear more about the crop here in just a minute too. Okay, which of the following plants provides the best loafing cover? And we're talking about for quail now, okay? Not for people, not for cows. Johnson grass, blue stem grass, western ragweed, loaf bush, or broom weed? Do we know what loafing cover is? No, not really. Well, we'll make sure we cover that before the day's out then too. Number eight, which of the following avian predators is the most formidable foe for quail? The great horned owl, the marsh hawk. Anybody know what a marsh hawk is? We don't call them marsh hawks anymore. Now they're northern harriers. But I left it marsh hawk just in case somebody here was from the old school like me. Uh, red tailed hawk, Cooper's hawk, or the golden eagle? Probably the red tail. Red tail? Like that one? Yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit more too. Which of the following species of grasses provides classical nesting habitat? We say classical because those of us in the biz, you know, we all like to refer to the same plant because some of the classical studies were done said, you know, this is where quail build their nests. So which of these do you think it might have been? Little blue stem, Johnson grass, side oats, grandma, buffalo grass, or flying grass? A, B, D, E. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Are we feeling pretty smart? No, not yet. Well, maybe we'll do better on the back of the page. Then. The ideal food for quail is doveweed, ragweed, insects, mesquite beans, or corn. They live in South Texas, they eat a lot of corn, right? <laughs> if you can afford it anymore. Yeah, if you can. Good point. Oh, doveweed. They do like them. They like all that stuff. Yeah, but one of them there provides more of the stuff they need than anything else. And I'm not sure if we'll have a chance to get into all of the details, but we'll try. Okay, we'll make it easy for you now. We're down to the true and false section. True or false. Cattle grazing at moderate stocking rates is probably the most cost effective tool for managing quail habitat. True or false. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure, why not? Let's say true. Okay, true or false, a quail hen has two functional ovaries. Never asked, did you? <laughs> we send those surveys out every year, they never come back. Just like the Census Bureau, you know? You gotta send somebody to housing. How many people live here? How many bathrooms you got? How many functional ovaries do you have? <laughs> Last time the guy asked me that, I had a bunch of True or false, there are two parts to a quail's stomach. Cows have four, we have one, quail have 
One, two, three, four. Don't know? Don't know. Okay, boy, we're going to have to dig deep here, Jenny. You're going to find out those things. Yep. Which of the following animals has been documented depredating whale nests? Raccoons, feral hogs, opossums, white-tailed deer, or all of the above? All of the above. You guys remember high school, right? When you, when you get the choice to say all of the above, you always say all of the above, right? That's right. <laughs> The only time it's a problem is when they say all of the above, sometimes some of the above, or sometimes all of the above. Uh -oh. <laughs> Finally, number 15, the most important concept in quail habitat management is that of usable space, weather modification, brush sculpting, supplemental food, or rest from livestock grazing. We already talked about that livestock grazing thing, but water. Weather's kind of important too. Um, and I think, I think, Jeff, aren't you going to be talking about brush sculpting later? That must be important, too. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about it. <laughs> Anybody feel like they got 100 yet? No. No? <laughs> okay, well, stay tuned. We'll have to fill in all of those blanks as the day goes on. Jenny's coming around and around with, uh, with second breakfast. Pasture to plate, make your own. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to We have six camps across the state. They're wildlife leadership camps, is what we call them. And basically, what we do is we use some critter, whether it be quail or bass or white-tailed deer and use that as a vehicle to teach kids biology, ecology, and leadership skills in a very intensive week-long uh, or five-day camp experience and then the, the experience goes on beyond camp as well. So I encourage you to look into that program. Um, <clears throat> but the motto of the Texas Brigades Involve me and I understand. So what we're going to do today is involve you in understanding this little critter in hopes that by understanding this little critter from the inside out, you'll be able to more effectively uh, manage his habitat or her habitat um, moving forward and back on your place. So <clears throat> one of the things we always do is we look at this little guy and kind of, kind of look at his adaptations. I think we have one female. Um, look at his adaptations, think about the things that this quail has that allow, allow him to survive, and as you listen to the lyrics... And this bird you cannot change. Dr. Gallagher, down there at the Extension Office in Uvalde, do y'all have any publications on crossbreeding quail? Uh, no, no, as a matter of fact, we don't. Do we you have, have publications uh, on crossbreeding cattle? Yes, we do. So it's the, the tech help. grasses and improve row crops. Yep, but we can't improve quail. So the take home message is these little critters aren't like livestock. We can't manipulate the animal in order to fit the habitat. So what we've got to do is understand the animal, understand its adaptations so that we can manipulate the habitat to fit the bird. So, and this bird you cannot change, if you go by that little axiom in quail management, you'll, you'll do well. So, how much does the quail weigh? Six to eight ounce bundle of adapta adaptations that allow it to survive in a pretty complex habitat, right? Contrary to what you may have heard in the past, not everything is bigger in Texas. <laughs> right? In terms of the wild quail size, we're on the short end of the scale. If you go north and east, quail get bigger. Down here in the southwest, the range, the range we get about the smallest they get. Well, a lot of it's just because of the heat load. Smaller bird is easier to lose heat than it is in a bigger body. And that applies not just to quail, but to everything. If you look at our white-tailed deer versus the ones that come from Indiana and Michigan, I mean, they get the big beefy ones, we get the little skinny ones. It's because of that heat load. It's easier to stay warm if you get a big fat body than it is if you get a little skinny one. So okay. Our birds, five, six grams, their birds, Seven, eight grams, so. Ounces. Or ounces, excuse ounces. me, ounces, thank you. Yeah, that would be a little bird. Yeah, <laughs> a little bird. Okay, so let's start looking at that external adaptation.
adaptations of this quail and, and think about how that might relate to its, uh, its habits and habitat needs. Okay, so start at the, the front. What kind of beak does this quail have? What kind of, by looking at his beak or her beak, what, what do you think they eat primarily? Seeds. So they've got a curved beak that's pretty stout looking. So it, it's, it's primarily used for cracking seeds and, and they do eat some insects. Um, so a quail is actually an omnivore because they eat herbaceous plant material and seeds, but then they also eat insects. So they're both predator and prey in that sense. Anybody ever look at the beak on a flycatcher? What does it look like? Yeah, it's got a long beak, yeah. Well, it's, it's short and hooked, yeah. but it's about this wide, right? Mm -hmm. Wider than their face is. So it makes a good sweet net if you're trying to catch bugs. What's the, the beak look like on a hawk? There one there. Yeah, beak there. yeah, it's a good tearing beak. Well, this one's actually kind of curved and tipped like a tearing beak, right? right. But it's kind of short and, and angled like you'd find on a sparrow or something else that eats just seeds, right? So it's not purely one or the other. Jenny said it's an omnivore. They are eating several different things. So they got a bill that's adapted, or excuse me, a beak that's adapted to eating several different types of feed. Okay, so moving on, look at their eyes. Think about the placement of the quail's eyes. Based on that, is the quail a predator or a prey? Prey. Any animal, you can, you can tell by looking at any skull in nature and find out if that animal is a predator or prey by looking at, one, their teeth, but secondly, their eye placement. If their eyes are on the front of their head like people, we're not near as concerned about things pouncing on us as a prey animal. We're a predator. We're, we want to be focused. We want to be focused on our prey, therefore our eyes are on the front of our head. Prey animals generally have their eyes on the side of their head so that they have a greater peripheral vision. So this, and this, this little bird is pretty dang good at peripheral vision. They've got a 320 degree peripheral vision as is, but because of their adaptation again of their neck being able to turn, all the way around and look directly behind them, they've really got a, a full 360 degree field of vision. Yeah, so another adaptation. Out, how, how far up to the sides can you see? I'm going to say, people generally, <coughs> we're talking somewhere between 160 and 180 degree field of vision. Mm -hmm. Real young people might go as far as 190. Those of us who got a few years can't do that anymore. But then again, think about what an owl's face looks like. Owl, obviously, is a predatory bird, right? And those eyeballs are right there in the front get that good binocular vision so they can judge distances very exactly. You know exactly when you're going to hit that bird. <laughs> so we have, um, I, I kind of missed their nostrils or their nares. You can see on the side of their bill they do have nostrils. So I'm sure they use that in sniffing out food items and maybe predators, I don't know. And then behind their eyes you can see some real specialized feathers that can kind of poke around behind their eyes. You'll see their ears. <laughs> So they can hear that big wing black dog coming. And there's also some real specialized feathers above their ears that I'm sure aid in, in hearing. But just, you can see there are different feathers over their ears than, than the rest of their body. Okay, so. Okay, so. <clears throat> let's look at some other external characteristics. What about their feet? What do those feet tell you? Are those gripping feet that pick up prey and carry it to like a raptor? Running. They're made for running. They're made for running, right? And they're also made for scratching around. See those long, sharp nails made for scratching to find, find seeds and other uh, food items? So specialized feet don't have a bunch of muscle. They're not the same kind of feet as if you look at a turkey foot that latches onto a branch. They don't need a lot of muscle in their feet to, to latch onto something. It's just for running and and for, for finding food. Okay, so, is it, look at your quail. Is your quail a, a female or a male? Male. Okay, y'all got the only female, and how can you tell? Hold your, hold your head up. Yeah. The female has that, that buffy color on these stripes on her head, and then the male always has the bright white. Okay, so, <clears throat> speaking of different coloration, what about quail's feathers? What adaptations, what, what functions do the feathers provide? There's three main ones that we always talk about. 
Okay, we'll Body is a very good one. Thermoregulation, very good. In the summertime, quail kind of will puff up, they'll get up under one of those loafing coverts. They'll puff up their feathers and it allows air to run through there and, and they pant. Quail pant. They're like, they don't have sweat glands, they're more like dogs. Anybody know what the pant is called? Here's a trivia for you. Part of the anatomy we haven't really talked about yet. Yeah. Somewhere between the, the beak and the chest. <laughs> what we call the gular region, not the gulag. We're not going to send anybody there to, to hold them in prison. This is the gular region. So they call it the gular flutter. It's basically their way, basically their way of panting. They, they trap air in their throat, I guess, that gular region, and just pant. And with their feathers all fluffed up, fluffed up they're able to kind of thermoregulate. So we've got camouflage. We've got thermoregulation. What's our next function of feathers? Yeah, we'll get to that in a second. That's more of a function of another organ that we'll talk about. Flight. Flight. Good. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> we can't fly without feathers. <clears throat> and I, I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday who's a vet, and he said, you know, we always talk about these main three functions of feathers being flight, color regulation, and camouflage. <clears throat> Excuse me, camouflage. He said there's really another function of feathers that's key. You might think of another function of feathers. We talked about the sex. Uh, incubating feathers, uh, incubating eggs. Well, yeah, I mean that's kind of the that's kind of the thermal regulation thing. He said reproduction. In that most birds, there's another trivial word for you, dis display sexual dimorphism. Meaning what? Difference Yeah, there's a difference. That her her feathers look different than his feathers, right? So we have sexual dimorphism, different uh, morphs of, of the feathers that are displayed by the feathers. So that's another thing. I mean, what do you call a, a male, uh, what's a green head? Mallard. It's a male mallard. But is a, is a green head a female mallard? No, no. no because it, they're sexual dimorphic. If he has a green head, she doesn't. So just another something. That's not for us though, right? They didn't do no. that for us so that we know the, the males and the females? So who did they do that for? Uh, hopefully for each other, right? <laughs> so they know which one is male and which one is female. Although it sure is handy when you're out there shooting ducks so you know which one is uh -huh. right. and why, why would a female usually be a little duskier, a little bit better camouflage than the male? Why do you think that must be? Tech In most cases, they, they're the ones that are taking that. And are males usually trying to attract mates? Which is really strange because it's just the opposite of what humans do. Uh, for the most that's part. what I was thinking. Yeah. No, no. You're much prettier than I am. But. <laughs> <laughs> My personal contention that is it's just the way it's supposed to be. The, the reason that women wear no makeup and getting their hair done is so that they can look just as good as the guys do. How many okay. people have bought that story? On that note, let's go back to adaptations. Okay, so let's look at these wings. What? I'm, I'm kind of spreading this quail's wings out here. What is the difference do you see between the shape of these wings and, say, the shape of a duck or a dove? Can you tell the difference when you see see a covey of quail flush? I mean, they look totally different when they fly. Let's say smaller, shorter flight time. Yeah. Well, in their wings, if you'll watch, to me, the thing that always clicks me off that, that those are quail, or especially if there's just one, is their wings are really curved, whereas a dove has a much more pointy wing. And, and that's exactly what it's for. These are sprinters, and we'll look at some more internal anatomy here in a minute that shows that they're sprinters, they're not marathon runners. These, this, is the, this is the quarter horse rather than the thoroughbred of the bird world. So the shape of their wings is very important. Um, <clears throat> while we're looking at wings, let's look at who, who selected answer B on how do you sex a quail or egg quail? On the, you already take them up? Nope, oh. they still got them. Okay, so wing feathers. Everybody kind of open up on your wings like this. Okay, we're going to look at some wings. <clears throat> and Jim, David, y'all may be able to tell all of these. The, the feathers we look at to age a quail 
are called the primary coverts. And I don't know the names of all of these feathers, but I know that these long ones on the front of the wing, you'll notice a, knee, a wing is, especially a quail wing, is just like a, a human arm. We've got our, all the bones end up, and then these are just, just the same structure as our arm, and then it ends up, these long feathers are fingers. Okay, so if you take those long finger feathers, those are called the primary feathers, the ones on the front of the wing, this part right here. And then you'll see there's a layer of feathers above that that kind of overlap it. This, pull these away. See, there's a layer that kind of sticks out. I think this is your thumb right here. And the bird pulled this in Olula. Olula. See, that's what I knew I didn't know. <laughs> but this, this layer of feathers directly above those primaries is called the primary coverts. They cover the primaries, so covert. Those primary coverts are the key to whether this is an adult or a juvenile bird. So if you look at those feathers, if they're gray, just a solid gray color all the way down, it's an adult bird. But if it's got a little bit of a different color on the tips, what we call a buffy color, kind of the same color as the head on that female, then it's a, a juvenile bird, this year's bird. And sometimes, these, these are starting to be replaced already. Does everybody figure out who has, does anybody have an adult bird? So these are Penrice birds. It's not surprising that they're less than a year old. They're all, I'll tell you, some of them bigger feathers have already molded. They almost all have that, just on the last three yeah. or four. So they're right on that. They're, all, they're probably a year old bird, right? Well, no. They're just coming up on a year? Or? They, they hit full adult plumage at 150 to 180 days. So we can't tell the difference after that. Uh, These are last small birds. Yeah, so. I'll scoot up over here. I keep putting my knee on here. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say we hit full of the somewhere between 150 and 180 days. And beyond that point, we can't tell the young of the year from the adult bird. Uh, up to that point, again, there's normally a, an orderly progression where you replace it. The first primary flight feather, then the second primary flight feather, the third, fourth, sixth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth. Uh, so we can age them basically to the week up until about 12 or 14 weeks of age. And then it's just, I don't know, can't do anything. They're not a whole year old yet. Right. So these are not a whole year old yet. They're not now how? They're, they're coming right up on six months. Six months, six months yeah. They're right on that. So no. They're not a whole year Okay. Um, now, why would you need to know how old a bird is? Why is that important? Especially for a landowner, you go out, you hunt, you have your hunters go hunt, they bring your bag in. <laughs> Again, why do we care how old these birds are? Right here, right now, we probably don't much. I, I, mean, I would guess that you're trying to figure out whether you're harvesting this year's birds or two years ago birds or whatever. But the ratio of young of the year to adult birds in the fall harvest is an important piece of information. It tells us where our population is going to go. The, the depressing thing from the quail's point of view, and I'll get into this in more detail later, the, the average quail lives to be all of six to eight months of age, and that's it. <laughs> and their longest lifespan is generally no say, more than a year. But there's, yeah. There, there have been like two instances since we started studying quail where people marked them and got a marked bird back that had lived for five years. Two out of the millions that we've looked at. <laughs> so the average lifespan is certainly less than a year. T typically six to eight months is about it. What's important is if you know they're not going to live a full year, you know you get to add new ones every year, right? Otherwise you run out really quick. So you're looking at the ratio of young of the year to adult birds in that fall harvest, and if it falls below about two young birds for every adult bird, you know which way your population is headed. Well, if it's like two, five, or six young birds for every old bird, then you know, you're headed the other way. Somewhere in between there, you typically get it around two and a half to three for young birds for old birds. It has a steady state. So you may not be ready to answer this question yet, but uh, at what age will they breed and what? Uh, how young can they have a clutch of eggs? You know? it, in a pet-raised bird, you could probably do it in five to six months. In a wild bird, they're not ready in five to six months. They're just not in physically good enough condition to do that. One, because it's probably December. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, November, December. So they, they don't get to breed until they're just darn near a year old. And most of them don't get that far. <laughs> that's why that's why quail are hard to manage in a wild setting so um so you're looking for when you bring your bird back in you're looking to have at mostly some adults if you pull those out and they most of them look like this you know if you've got 70 percent you are home free now if you pull your first bird bag out of the season and you've got 30 percent of young birds to old birds, you may want to reevaluate how much you want to hunt that year. Might have been a really tough nesting season the year before, and you might want to preserve as many of those birds for the following year's nesting season as you can. So it's just a good way to evaluate your harvest strategies and see where you're going. You know, look at it over and keep records from year to year and see how you're doing. In, in general, a lot of times you can tell. This year I live in Duval County. I know good and well I'm not going to see many young birds in my bird bag next year if we even hunt it. So, but this past year it was pretty dang good. So you can generally predict it, but it's a good a good indicator of what your harvest strategy should be moving forward. Okay, so moving on down this bird, we talked about the wings and the anatomy there and why it's important. Um, and somebody talked about waterproofing feathers. Duck, we know ducks do that. What do they? What do you call it when they when they kind of fluff their feathers and take care of them and cream good. Now, is, do they just peck on them or how do they waterproof their feathers? Spread oil. Which comes uh, from? A gland. A gland? Uh, usually the tail. That's right. Uh -huh. If you will kind of pick up the tail feathers of the bird and just kind of poke around there, you'll see a little gland. It looks like kind of right above the, the tail stiff tail, tail feathers. It looks just like this. See it? No, it's on top of the tail. On the top side of the tail. See, here's his, his stiff tail feathers. See that right there? I just squeezed it. There's a little oil coming out of it. Yeah, there you go. Up, up here. There you go. Based there. on what you've heard yeah. so far today, what do you think the name of that gland might be? And I kind of I kind of wiggled mine and oil came out. Yeah, oil well, <laughs> gland is what most people call it, or a preening gland. Yeah, it's that mythical uropygial gland. Uh, <laughs> uropygial. Uropygial gland. I really want to do this. <laughs> but yeah, if you, if you kind of, I mean, I just touched it and the oil came out. You can see it. Yeah, that's how you can tell your bird is still fresh. Yeah. You still got okay. All coming out of so, any other external adaptations, Jim? Are we ready to dive in? Um, I'm sure we missed something and it'll come to us later, but yeah, I think we're good for now. Yeah, I think we're good. Here's a, here's a trivial question for you, talking about adaptations. What's a, and as we get down to this end of the bird, what's this part down here called? Yeah. Yes, or otherwise known as the vent. Quail, because they have to fly, they have to fly fast, and most birds are, I think all birds are this way, who have one vent for everything. It serves all functions that usually occur and that is its reproduction and its waste and its um, urine. So what's the white stuff in quail poop? In bird poop? Bird poop. Oh, yeah, you got it right. More bird poop. <laughs> but yes, the white stuff is they, they, they poop and they eat at the same time and that's one of their adaptations. I mean, it's goofy as it sounds, it's one of their adaptations to be more efficient and therefore not weigh as much and not have as many things going on. They're a much simpler creature because of their need to be airborne than, than mammals and, and other Let me follow that up with another good trivia point. There, there is one bird in the world, one bird in the world that we know of that has a bladder. You had to guess what kind of bird would have a bladder. We just talked about saving weight so we can fly. Ostrich. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Yes, an ostrich is the only bird known to have a bladder because they don't have to worry about getting off the ground. Huh. <laughs> Emu? No, as far as we know, they don't. Or maybe they do, it's just a small noise they've really noticed. <laughs> Nobody ever cares. Yeah. And what I want you to do is just get in there and peel the skin 
You might you might have to cut it, but you should just be able to peel it back, kind of like you do with the dove. Just peel it back and expose that breast muscle. Okay. You can use your little mine will peel pretty easy. Kind of peel it down over their legs a little bit too. You're just exposing the breast muscle here. <laughs> yeah, I just kind of I just want you to be able to see their leg muscles. And then kind of peel up, up towards their chin too. We want to expose all that stuff in their neck. Okay. So let's look at this breast. Muscle here. Talking about adaptations again. We talked about that these birds are sprinters. They're not marathon runners. Tell me about this breast muscle. Is it white or dark meat? Has everybody got an exposed pretty good? Yes. Light or dark meat? Dark. Dark. Think about a chicken breast. It looks about the way a raw chicken breast. Compare right with a dove breast. Huh? Yeah, compare it with the yeah, dove breast. How many of you have opened up a dove? Yeah, it's, it's almost a dove. Yeah, a yeah. Light. dove's a lot darker. So this is light meat. Mm -hmm. Now, why would a quail have light meat and a dove have dark meat? How's the dove make his living? Well, the dove make his living? You said the dove tastes better or the quail does? Quail tastes better. To me, it's because it's light meat. And that's because of a substance, a hemo, hemoglobin type substance called myoglobin in the muscle. That, Myo means muscle. Yeah. That, that allows them to have more stamina. A, a dove. A dove has more stamina, therefore it has more, it has more myoglobin, therefore it has more stamina, therefore that darker color in, in the meat. Now look at their, now these are not as good as an example since they're, they're pin raised birds, but if you look at their legs, their legs tend to be a little bit darker. And it's because they run. So they have more myoglobin in their legs. What about a dove? Have you ever looked at a dove? Because the breast stroke is flying. Right. But a dove's legs are not. They're lighter meat. So we've got, we've got a, a totally different lifestyle and therefore no, totally different meat colors. So another thing, think about a dove also. How big is their breast muscle? If you breast out a dove, wrapping and making, how big is it? Is it this big? No, it's about half. It's about half that size, right? And that also has to do with the fact they're trying to be more efficient, okay? And this, this, um, because they have to fly longer distances. This quail, on the other hand, his breast is very tall. Take your scalpel if you can, and cut down this mid mid part, what we would call our sternum. We call it in a, in a bird the keel and cut the breast muscle down just right next to that keel, all the way down. I want you to see how tall that keel is. Cut all the way down to the rib cage. Just kind of peel that breast muscle away. Okay, so as you peel that breast muscle away, you see how tall that keel is? Think so again to a dove. We're cutting where? Just cut it. Just down the keel. Yeah, straight, straight down right here. Just want to peel that breast muscle around a little bit. Yeah, yeah, just like you were playing it off. So that again, that is because they need. They're powerful. Well, they're powerful flyers. They have to take off and get away quickly. And so that power is needed. They need that strong keel to to. Supply the, the strength they need to for some heavy wing beats. Wing beats. A dove just needs stamina. They don't need aggressively as a quail does. So that keel provides that strength, and then the larger breast muscle also just the, the power that they need to to really get up and go. One of the things that's always impressed me you know, you're down the county road going 30, 40 miles an hour, and a dove passes you doing like 50, 60, and you just kind of go. Quail beating itself to death to make it up to 20. Okay. Okay, so now it's time. Well, actually, while we're here, let's go up. If you can, kind of peel that, um, their skin up all the way to their chin. You may need to 
use your scalpel and just kind of peel it away from all the stuff underneath. Now these are, unfortunately, these birds haven't eaten anything today, so you're going to see their crop, but it's going to be hard to, you're not going to be able to see anything in it. What's the crop? <laughs> Creatures that eat, that live an eat and run lifestyle. They've got to run out and where's their most abundant quality food sources? Out in the open. Out in the open. So they've got to run out there, find a little insect, find a little... Find a pile of seeds. Find a little pile of seeds or some nice vegetative material, and then run back. So what they do is they eat, 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 puts it in this little Ziploc bag we call a crop, run back, get under one of those loping cur coverts, and then they, they start the digestive process after that. There is no digestion that occurs in the crop. It's just a storage facility. So can you, everybody find the crop? It's empty, but it should be there. Oh, I, if y'all want to see a crop with something in it, this one might be eating. Okay, so let's talk about digestion. So a quail runs out in the open and it finds whatever it's going to eat. What's the, what are some primary food sources for quail? Insects, right? Insects are there. That's quail. What, I mean, that's their best, most ideal food. Insects, seeds, and then and and grain, and then uh, forbs. Who knows what a forb is? Otherwise, there is a weed. 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 Yeah. It okay, changes so, through the year, right? Yeah. All the winter, what do you got to work with? It's cold, there's nothing growing. No, like seeds, no, you got seeds, seeds, basically. Seeds are survival food, right? High energy, from all the starch that's in the seed, most of them are not real high in protein, but it'll keep you going. An insect is a quail MRE. Yep. Spring comes, things start to green up. What do quail eat the first thing in the spring? Forbs, yeah, as soon as those little bitty forbs start coming up out of the ground, before they even get to be an inch tall, they're picking out that little green stuff and sucking it down because it's easy to digest and it's high protein. It starts to warm up a little bit. Who else is trying to eat that little green stuff? Every deer, everybody else. Well, but all the insects go up when it starts warming up, right? So now you can pick up some greens and insects at the same time. There you go. Get your meat and potatoes at the same time. Okay, so let's talk about that. We, we go out, we find our little insect or our seed or whatever. If you look on your quail, talk, what's the first the first digestive organ? Would be the gizzard. Or that. It's not really an organ. Well, the beak. Okay, so we got we got to get it in there somehow first. Okay, and then we go down the. Esophagus. esophagus. And identify your esophagus. You'll see your, your trachea is the first thing you see, the little thing with rings. So that's the windpipe. And then to the left of the, your left of the esophagus and kind of under, I mean the windpipe, and kind of under the windpipe, you'll find your esophagus. And if you found your crop, you can kind of follow it up and you'll find the esophagus. Okay? And so then the first thing it, that comes to from the esophagus is that crop. So it's got its little storage, storage mechanism there. And then we disappear into the into the body cavity. So what I want you to do is take your, you may just be able to do it by your hand, but peel open that breast muscle from the bottom, and you may have to cut on it. I've got some scissors here. Okay, we want to peel it all the way back over their head so that um, so that we can see everything inside. Try not to smush anything in the process. Just kind of cut where you can get all the way up in there. You get it laid all the way open, you need to cut it to see more. Oh, you got it. Yeah, he, he's laid his open. Good, perfect. He's had a little more trouble getting it. Okay, so once you get it to where it'll lay back on its own, you can. Okay, so you'll see kind of sticking up on the sides is the rib cage. You don't think about it birds having ribs, but they do, right here. And if you want to kind of cut those ribs away, that might help. We want to, we want to see everything in there. We want to see where those, um, that trachea and esophagus disappeared. We want to follow them from there. 
Okay, so once we've passed, you, you see, do you see the esophagus, or the, I mean, the, the trachea right there? It's usually the easiest thing to see right here. So we see our trachea coming down. What's this first? You still getting your bone? Might be easier to cut it with this. Yeah, what's that first first thing you see kind of on top? The heart. Anybody that wants to give a heart to Mr. Tang later? Okay, so we've got our heart. Okay, we've got our heart. What's this big? That's the gizzard. The big, the next big thing you see there. Coming up light. Yeah, that's the gizzard. What's this red? I hope there? so. Liver. Okay, it's got a pretty big liver. So what's the liver? Over there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know what this what is? Well, we'll take the first part. Filters. Filters. <laughs> Okay, everybody move your liver to the uh, to the left. Actually, start with the heart. I'm sorry. Start with your heart and move the heart to the left. That's really good. Yeah. Here, turn it this way. So my left and right work. <laughs> and you'll see under there, right up against the ribs, you see some fluffy pink, pinkish stuff. Suction. That would be long. Cut up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm looking at that. There's no one. Is that the same one? No, nope, there's two of them. Yeah. 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 Is this, is this the liver? Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, what is this? That's the gizzard. Gizzard, okay. And this? We'll get to that in a second. Okay. That's fun. I'm glad that's there. Okay, this is lungs. You got two of them? Is this a male? Well, that's not the most efficient way to move air through, is it? Okay. Don't tell me that's what I think it is. There's two of them. Instead of that little balloon in the end, birds actually have this little balloon that makes a little U-turn. So the air doesn't have to stop and turn around and come back. It just goes. <laughs> so their lungs work more efficiently than ours do to begin with. And then these guys don't spend near as much time flying as doves do, so they don't need the great big lungs to so find it more flight-oriented birds. Okay, so let's go back to the digestive tract. So we know we start at the beak, we go down the esophagus, we get to the gizzard, then we've got some more esophagus, which is right here, and then there's a little bone before you get to the gizzard. How many stomachs does a quail have? Okay, I'll guess two. Good! Good guess. So that, Only because I found two things, I don't know what they are. <laughs> so there's this little bone, and then you've got some more esophagus, and then you've got gizzard. So that little bulb is called the proventriculus. It's the first stomach, and it's where the, it's called the um, chemical stomach. The, that's not the right word. Which one's the first, which one's the second? Well, the proventriculus is the one on the top. Um, glandular stomach, that's the word I'm looking for. Okay, so it's called the glandular stomach. It's the one that breaks down the easy stuff first, okay? The, any, any soft materials that starts breaking those down and pulling nutrients out of them already. Okay, and then you go from there to the gizzard, which is that big hard thing. Okay, now how many of you have heard of, of uh, birds, uh, chickens, stuff like that? They have to have rocks or, or, or gravel. Yeah, that's where it goes. It goes into the gizzard. The gizzard, the gizzard is the muscular stomach. It takes that grit and just really grinds on those seeds and stuff. Somebody cut open your gizzard. Okay, just kind of slice it open, and then you'll see that it's very muscular. There's a big, big layer of muscle before you get to the little cavity on the inside. So cut it all the way open and kind of peel it open. The grit is chicken teeth. How many teeth does a quail have? Teeth. In its lifetime, how many teeth does a quail have? Okay, he's full of stuff. Not quite there. 
Oh, then when they're born, they have that hook on the end of the beak. Yeah. Okay. It's a quail with their hat. Okay. We have got. Oh, we've got stuff in the gizzard. Yes. Okay, well, kind of, kind of scrape the stuff away and look at the lining of the gizzard. And if you can feel it, you may not be able to feel it, but that lining on the inside of the gizzard is real sandpapery. And so that, that paired with any gravel or, or pieces of rocks and stuff that they've picked up is what really grinds up any hard food that they eat. Okay? Okay. Now this, I guess so, that's the, yeah, that's that's got to be it right there. Yeah. The lining, yeah. Yeah, see how it, rough it is? It's stained green from what it's been eating, right. but yeah. It's real rough like sandpaper. Uh-huh. Oh, you peel that inside part off? See the, 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 the grooves in it that way there? I guess it, it probably rubs. Yeah. Somehow. Well, it's tough, and I bet it probably doesn't taste as good because it's what doesn't have the contact of the meat. But, but, but so the things to take home here are how strong, how thick that muscle is surrounding that little lining, and then also that sandpapery stuff. So it takes care, it's the muscular stomach that takes care of the hard grinding work. Okay, so after the gizzard, kind of follow down what, what we've got after our stomach. Small intestines, we're going to look at a couple of things. So we've got our small intestines. What's the function of small, the small intestine? Absorption, right. So we've gotten hopefully all of the nutrients, big nutrients, out of the food at this point. So the small intestine is transporting the waste out, but it's it's also pulling out the rest of the, the liquid and any other goodies it can pull out and absorbing those back into the body. So if you kind of pull those, yeah, if you start, once you get it going, it'll pull out. Um, kind of pull it so that you can kind of straighten it out. What we're going to find is yeah, at, at the... See how much there is, yeah, and how much, how efficient they have to be. How much, would you think there's much, say, moisture in a seed? Say again. How much moisture do you think there is in a seed? Not much. They're dry on the outside, but on the inside. Yeah, they've got some moisture, and so that these quail need to be pretty dang efficient gathering moisture. Do quail need standing water to survive? I think so. They don't need standing water. They do not need a puddle or anything to drink out. They get all of the food, they, the water they need from the food they eat and then do on leaves and stuff like that. So they have to have a very efficient system of pulling moisture out of the food they eat. Therefore, lots of small intestines. Think, think about this again. There's not much moisture in the seed. There's pretty good moisture in those greens they've been eating, though, right? Most of the insects are kind of juicy. But there's more moisture in that seed than you give them credit for. Because that seed's full of starch. And actually, when they digest the starch, what happens there is each one, each one of those starch molecules, the big hairy starch molecules, is just a bunch of little simple sugars held together by water. So when you digest the starch, you actually release water. So they're actually getting water out of there that we don't give them credit for. So most of the water they need is coming straight out of the food they're eating. If there is due in the morning, they will go yeah. take advantage of that. Okay, so let's, from there we go to the large intestine and then out the vent. We get the rest of that moisture out and then we get rid of the rest. Okay. So, I'm really excited about this. We're going to go from here to reproduction. And these birds are, sometimes, if, depending on time of year, it's hard to find the reproductive organs of the quail. Because when they're not using them, they're tiny. Testes will be the size of this pin head, if that. They look, they're smaller than a BB, and the ovaries are almost impossible to find. But we have an ovary on this bird. If y'all want to come look at this one, and again, we only have one functioning ovary. Why? Well, only have one functioning ovary. That one's huge, is that? I don't know if there's something wrong with that or if it's just bloated, but. They're usually not that big. There's no egg in it, is there? It should be a little early for eggs, but uh, again, it's a... That has to be what that is, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so well, that's the ovary. These are if there was an birds, egg, so they're a little out of sync with the wild bird, so yeah, I wouldn't, wouldn't doubt it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they're pin-raised birds, so they're awful. Look, see, but there's a, kind of a bulb right there. That might be the beginning of an egg. But you'll see... There's, so that, is that what it is? So you're the yeah, embryology person. So we've got eggs, eggs coming down the chute, which is really cool. Hmm. Now, there's only one. What side is it on? The bird's, the bird's left hand side. Yep. 
for some reason, it's, their reproductive organs are always on the left. In the females. Yeah. Yeah, the males have two, so. So, we've got an ovary, which is cool. Now, see if you can find testes. Yep, right there. And again, that's, it's cool to see that. Oh, yeah. It's cool to see that because if this was not reproductive season, which is really early, I didn't think we'd have them yet. It's, it's the end of April. Yeah. I mean, they're gearing up. Yeah. If, if, I'm serious, if, if it was not this time of year, those would be little black specks all the way up against their, their backbone. Now, why would they be all the way up against their backbone? Okay, protection. What else do we have up against the backbone in a quail? What's this? Pink stuff. Oh, lungs. Some lungs. So, yeah, guys, if you've yeah. ever, I mean, this has been in the news for like 25 years. There's, there's a big difference between wearing boxers and briefs, right? right. <laughs> Keeping them cool. Yeah, right, cool. Protect, for protection there. Yeah, they, right. they don't work unless they're cool. Well, spermatozoa are the most temperature sensitive cells in the body. In the human, male, if your spermatozoa hit 98.6 that the rest of the body's at, they're dead. That's it. The little swimmers don't swim them. <laughs> Quail are a little warmer than we are. Average body temperature is 101, uh, So, again, you got to keep those testes relatively cool, otherwise the little swimmers don't swim. How do you keep them cool if they're inside your body? You get them out closer to the Yeah, you get them somewhere close to the surface so they can lose heat to the outside, right? <laughs> yep, yeah. that's it. Yeah. You gotta keep the eggs warm so the testes cool. There's a big difference. Okay, so we've got our reproductive system. What do you call mating in the How do they breed? How do they breed? <laughs> you have to understand that occasionally biologists get bored. <laughs> We come up with weird names for things. So the British are the worst. What did we call the, the bin? You said it. Cloaca. Cloaca. So they call breeding the cloacal kiss. 